Hey everyone, it's Henry again from Fine Land Games, and today I am doing the second part of the first two-player starter set, Mammals vs. Reptiles and Amphibians, with the Reptiles and Amphibians. This is all the uh, animal cards for Reptiles and Amphibians, as well as the adaptations and the last four objectives that I haven't shown yet. So we'll go ahead and get right into it. If you haven't watched the first part, go ahead and watch that to get the mammal side. But the first common for reptiles and amphibians in this set is the painted turtle. And the painted turtle does one thing, it tanks. It's a uh, 7 cost for 3 forage, which is not amazing until you realize that it has 4 defense. Now, 4 defense early game is very difficult to get over. Um, this animal actually used to be too strong in testing, it used to have 5 defense, and it was utterly broken. Uh, so tuned down a bit to 4 defense with 5 health and 3 attack, 1 speed because it is a turtle and it's very slow, but it has a speed of 4 and aquatic biomes. Not that that ever matters too much, you are normally either using this as a high cost forager, which is not ideal, or using it to just sit and tank in the front row so you can stall and build up your economy, but it offers you that flexibility, so very annoying to play against sometimes, um, very tanky boy. Secondly, we have the Day Gecko. Five cost, who forages for three, so bog standard in that regard. Uh, four health, two attack, one defense, pretty standard across the board, pretty slow at four speed. Uh, but its evasion is increased by two in forest biomes. It actually doesn't have great evasion to begin with at 19 plus, but at least you get it down to 17. So you have a you know 20% chance of evasion. Sorry, evading. Uh, at you know 17 plus but still not great but a very you know standard forager for the reptiles and amphibians here we have the american toad the only amphibian in the reptiles and amphibians uh two player starter set in the core set there's lots more amphibians but he's the only one here uh four health sorry yeah four four food cost for a forage of three which is very efficient uh, it's a very, very good forager with the health of two and attack of two. Sorry, health of three, attack of two, speed of four, so again, quite slow. Um, pretty interesting ability, though. You may sacrifice this animal to draw two cards and then discard one. And this can happen at any time. So let's say your American Toad has a poison counter on him and he has one health left, so you know he's going to die in the status phase. Sacrifice him at the end of the combat phase and get some, uh, you know, get two cards for it. Uh, you have to discard one, so it's not just a straight up two cards, but offers a lot of flexibility if he's about to die. Or just any time you are low on resources and you do to sacrifice a forager. Next up, we move to a bit of an attacker here, the corn snake. Again, seven cost for plus three, just like the painted turtle. Um, so not a great forager, but you could use him in a pinch. Uh, but uh, it definitely shines more as an early game attacker with six health, four attack and one defense. Again, slow at four speed. The reptiles and amphibians are the slowest faction. It's a lot more about, you know, planning your moves and having strong effects that happen, you know, later and really playing things out being, you know, cunning instead of just strong or speedy. Uh, this animal's attack is increased by one while attacking rodents, so particularly good against mammal foragers. Uh, the mammal two player starter set will be running six rodents, so decent chance to get that ability off, and even without it, you know, decent early game uh, thing to put in your front row. Not not super weak with the six health and one defense, and it can hit decently hard for an early game creature. Early game animal, sorry. So probably in the first couple sets you'll be playing this. Not Probably not late game. Uh, we then move on to the ten cost representative for this faction, and that is the Gila Monster. Cost 10 with a forage of 2, so not a forager. It is the counterpart to the Ocelot. Um, the Gila monster has 8 health, 5 attack, and 2 defense. Again, very slow with 3 speed, but 2 defense makes it quite tanky for something you're playing early game. And if this animal deals damage while attacking, place 1 poison counter on the defender. That, a lot of times, can be really big, especially if you get lucky on the poison for a refresher for those who need it. When you resolve a poison counter during the status phase, you remove the poison counter from the animal and then roll 1d4, and whatever the 1d4 shows, whatever number you get, that's how much damage you take. So you could conceivably hit something for 5, put a poison counter on it, and then they get poisoned for 4, and suddenly you've done 9 damage. 
for a 10 cost creature, that's very, very good. So definitely a, a great, you know, standard 10 cost attacker. Moving up just a little bit to the last common, we have an 11 cost Indigo Snake. And it forages for 2, so not a forager. Um, cost 10, sorry, cost 11 with a health of 10, attack of 6, defense of 1, speed of 5. Actually, remarkably, uh, the fastest thing we've seen so far for this faction. Uh, I don't know why these show up over there. Interesting. Um, interesting ability on this one. If this animal deals damage to an enemy with 6 or less max health, place a stun counter on them. If they are already exhausted, deal one extra damage instead. So the way stun counters work, for those of you who don't know, is if you place a stun counter on an animal that ha is not exhausted, it immediately becomes exhausted. And if you place a stun counter on an enemy that is already exhausted, at the end of the status phase when all the other animals unexhaust, you remove the stun counter instead and the animal stays exhausted so you kind of make them lose a turn however with the indigo snake you can't you can't get that second effect because if they're already exhausted you just deal one extra damage so you can prevent things from having a turn by stunning them if they have six or less max health or you deal more damage to things that have already gone um, which is not bad uh, seven damage for an 11 cost is not bad at all um, and it's decently tanky it'll, it'll survive a decent amount of time Moving on to the uncommons, we have the Western Diamondback Rattlesnake, costing 14. With very similar stats to the Indigo Snake, 10 health, 7 attack, 1 defense, 1 more attack than the Indigo Snake. But the ability is where this card shines. When this animal is attacked, deal 3 damage to the attacker. When this uh, animal deals damage, roll 1d20. On a 12 or higher, place 1 poison counter on the enemy. So. That 3 damage when it gets attacked, it doesn't matter if it dies, or if it dodges, or what, or if the opponent does no damage. That 3 damage is happening, and that is not affected by defense, so it is just 3 damage straight to the attacker. And that triggers the second part of this ability, because when the animal deals damage, you have a chance to poison. So, it, you know, it's, it's very annoying as a wall in the front row, where you just sit it there, and your opponent doesn't really want to attack it, because they could take 7 damage with that poison counter. Uh, so very annoying, very good for walling up. Um, a pretty good attacker as well, because you can place that poison counter when you attack. So definitely a very strong card. Probably one of the best bang for your buck animals in the two-player starter set. The next uncommon we have is the Spectacled Caiman. It costs 16. It is a crocodilian, the only crocodilian in the two-player starter set. Uh, it has 13 health, 10 attack, and 2 defense. So very tanky and hits pretty hard. Uh, its speed is increased in aquatic biomes by one, and its attack is increased by one if you control at least one other crocodilian. Now this does work if you control two caimans. They give each other the plus one attack because it's another crocodilian. It doesn't have to be another species, it just has to be another crocodilian. Um, that being said, very very great all-round animal. At 16 you're getting something that can take a beating and dish one out. Um, so very, very respectable, kind of a jack-of-all-trades, except, you know, you can't really forage with it, but that's okay. You probably don't want to be foraging with uh, something that costs 16 unless it forages for a great amount. The last uncommon we have is Parsons Chameleon, costing 12 food with a forage of 4. Uh, so can definitely be a forager for you, it just costs a bit. And it has 10 health, 4 attack, 1 defense, and 2 speed, so very slow. Um, but you have decent evasion chance with its ability. Its evasion chance is increased by 3 while defending against the first attack each turn. And this is the big unique thing about the chameleon. It can attack from the back row. So the, the general game plan with the chameleon is you play it to the back row. And the turn you play it, you attack with it. And then it'll unexhaust at the end of that turn, and the next turn you can forage for that 4. Or additionally, bring it as you know, fire support for an extra 4 damage coming from the back where it's protected. You could put it in the front and hope you evade if you're only facing 1 attack per turn, but you do not want to be facing more than 1 attack because a natural 19, um, a 19 plus to evade is, is not good. You have a 10% a chance to evade attacks without your little boost there, which gets you to uh, 25. So, um, very good, 
you know, flexible creature. You can forage with it, you can attack with it. Definitely want to keep it in the back row no matter what, unless you are really desperate. Finally, we move on to the boss of the reptiles and amphibians in this set, and that is the King Cobra. This is the big guy, costing 25 food, so one less than its counterpart, the lion. It is a snake, and uh, it has 16 health, 12 attack, 1 defense, 5 speed, forges for 2. Um, the big thing again on this one is its ability. This animal can attack the back row with an attack of 6. When this animal deals damage, place 2 poison counters on the defender. So, King Cobra has options when you put it in the front row. You want to make sure it's able to get an attack off. Um, because it is not su for something that costs 25 and can hit really hard, it only has 16 health and 1 defense, and it's slow. So, if, you, if it's up against any kind of decent attacker it's dead in one or two turns but if it hits you can a go for their economy in the back because you're doing a minimum absolute minimum of eight damage when you're attacking the back row or 14 to the front row because the lowest those poison counters can be is one you can do up to 20 damage if you roll two fours or up to uh, 14 damage if you're attacking the back row which is absurd um, so you really want to be able to, in certain situations, attack your opponent's back row with it and cripple their economy, or if you need to kill something in the front row, you know, damage, poison damage is unblockable. It, it's not affected by defense, so you're able to get quite a bit of damage through as long as you hit. The worst thing in the world is putting out a King Cobra, getting hit with it, but it's still alive, and then swinging at something and they dodge, and now you've just wasted your 25 food snake. But if it hits, it is very, very good, and it it's very good as like a, a standalone. You don't really need any support for it. All right, moving on to the adaptations. Just like the mammals, there are six: four commons and two uncommons. The first common is dig in. Very simple. An animal you control is defending. You may increase its defense by two until the combat is resolved. So just the inverse of the mammal one. This is the reptile and amphibian one cost instant that boosts a stat. Every faction has one. Uh, dig in is great in a pinch, especially uh, since your animals are slow. And you need them to be able to survive and get their attacks off. So there's not a lot that feels better than your opponent thinking that they can kill your your diamondback rattlesnake that's been annoying them all game, and then you just say, "Nope, two more defense. My rattlesnake survives." It's uh, an instant that happens in during the combat phase. And again, I'll say it like I did for the mammal one. You want to use this card after you see if you evade. So you want to roll your evasion dice, and if you're still getting hit, then you play your dig in. You don't want to play it before you roll your evasion dice because you might waste it. But very strong card um, can really save your creatures and let them attack afterward. Next up, we have Snake Bite. It is for snakes only. It is a three cost instant adaptation. At the start of the combat phase, as long as you control a snake in the front row, you may deal two damage to any opposing animal in the front row. And this is unaffected by defense. Any cards that say deal X amount of damage, that gets through defense. It's not an attack. Um, so as long as you control a snake, which in this set you have four different snakes to choose from, and you'll have three copies of each, so 12 snakes. So this will be, you know, be active most of the game. Uh, you can deal instantly two damage to any opposing animal in the front row. This can be very good if your opponent has a cheetah or something. It's on one or two health, and they would ordinarily be able to kill you. You can drop this immediately and pop them, uh, which can be very strong. Somewhat situational, but can be very strong. Here we have Extra Poison, a three-cost instant. When one of your animals places a poison counter on an enemy, you may place an additional poison counter on that enemy. Uh, for three costs, do you really want to hope that you're rolling a three or a four on that poison counter? But this can be very annoying for your opponent who thinks, yeah, I, I could take a poison counter, or, or I could take two, and then and still survive, and then you give them a third, or you give them a second one, and suddenly that ruins their plans. Um, so, very good adaptation. Again, situational, but you have a few things that place poison. You've got your Gila monster, you've got your Diamondback Rattlesnake, and you've got your King Cobra all placing poison counters. And... This gets much better in the core set when you have way more things that place poison. So definitely one you'll want to hang on to. Lastly, we have Ambush, which can be very, very strong, or it can be useless. Uh, three cost equip. 
equip this card to one of your reptiles in the front row. So no amphibians, no American toad, sorry. At the start of any combat phase, you may discard this card from that animal to attack an opposing animal in the front row that was played this turn. So this helps you get around your slow speed. You, you put this on something slow, and then any animal that your opponent played this round, you can discard this at the start of the combat phase and basically cheat your way to the front of the line and activate your slow animal before they can activate any of their fast animals. So this can be very good on a King Cobra or any of the decent hitters here. You put this on them and then if your opponent, again I'll use a cheetah for example because it's a glass cannon and it's very fast, it will always have a speed advantage against any of your animals, but you put ambush on a caiman or something and suddenly you can deal your 10 damage before the cheetah ever gets a chance to go. So it can be very strong, um, but remember it is only animals that were played this round. So any animal that was played in previous rounds, you cannot ambush them. On to the two uncommons. First one we have is Heat Wave, a 4 cost instant that deals 2 damage to uh, all mammals on the field. You activate it during the status phase. This is the inverse to Cold Snap that the, animal, that the mammals have. It is, um, can be very, very, very strong, especially if your opponent has things in their back row that are foraging and are damaged and only have one or two health left. You can wipe them all out instantly during the status phase with this, but it is only targeted at mammals, so useless against the other factions. Uh, so keep that in mind. Last but not least, we have the final uncommon adaptation. Bonus armor. It is a four cost for reptiles only, so again, Sorry, American Toad, not for you. It's a persistent adaptation that as long as this card remains in the field, all your reptiles have their defense increased by one. So this can be quite strong and quite annoying when you pair it with Dig In to give your one animal two defense when they're attacked. Uh, this affects all your reptiles all the time. So suddenly, your Gila monster with two defense now has three. Your Painted Turtle has a whopping five. Everything gets one extra defense. That can be very, very strong and very annoying for your opponent to deal with because that's just flat damage reduction across the board. Uh, of course, insta unless it's like effects or things that deal directly to you. Um, but you know, it's pricey, but you want to try to play this early in a set, um, and then you get a bunch of reptiles on the field who are all benefiting from it. It can be very good. So that wraps up uh, all the cards in the deck for the Reptiles and Amphibians, but we'll go over the last four objectives. Like I said last episode, you get eight objective cards in a two-player starter set. Uh, I did four of them with the mammals, and these are the other four. And these ones, the mammal one, the ones I did with the mammals, the first four were pretty simple. These ones get a bit more complicated. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have the Arctic Tundra. It is a terrestrial polar biome. The objective reads, the player with the most food after 10 rounds wins. That's nothing new. Adaptations cannot be played. Once per turn during the management phase, players may discard one adaptation from their hand to gain two food and draw one card. So this is a great choice if you think your opponent is going to play a bunch of adaptations, or if you play a bunch of adaptations and want to gain a bunch of food and, and resources in your hand. Um, player with the most food after 10 rounds, that's pretty standard. Um, that is similar to uh, one of the previous objectives, I believe it's the Tropical Rainforest, which is 12 rounds, this one's 10, so a bit shorter. Uh, but the big thing about this is no adaptations, and the ability to get food and uh, card draw for sacrificing them. So, an interesting objective, uh, not one that's been played too much, but one that I think can be very good uh, against the right deck. Next we have Savannah, which is a very unique objective, it's a terrestrial grassland. Each player has 20 health. Think Magic the Gathering or Hearthstone or something. Animals can attack the opposing player's health points if there are no unexhausted animals in the opposing front row. First player's health to reach zero loses. So you're basically normally going to have animals in your front row protecting your back row. But now they're protecting your back row and they're protecting you. You are basically acting as an animal who can't do anything and just has 20 health. In your back row. Um, so again, like I said, a la Magic the Gathering or Hearthstone, you're, you make the decision a lot of the time to go for your opponent's back row or go for the face. And um, you know, one or two hits from something big, uh, and you've lost the objective. So you definitely want to make sure that you are protecting yourself with things in your front row and actively trying to get to your opponent's health directly. 
Next we have Freshwater Swamp, which has a big old block of text. It is a aquatic and arboreal freshwater biome. Players draw 10 cards at the start of the set and are allowed one mulligan outside of the normal mulligan rules. I'll go over that in a second. No other cards may be drawn the rest of the set. This includes searching the deck, playing from the deck, etc. The player with the most animals on the board after 10 rounds wins. So, first things first, your normal mulligan rule is if you draw your hand and you don't have an animal you can play with the amount of food you currently have, you shuffle that hand back into your deck and draw a new hand and you do that until you have an animal you can play uh, with the amount of food you have. With this one, you draw your 10 cards and then that rule still applies and if you don't like the first hand you draw, you can put those back and get a new 10 cards and then you're stuck with those as long as you're within the normal rules of, of a mulligan. Um, so this one is, is pretty good at giving players limited resources to work with. You get your 10 cards and that's it. You can't get anything else from the deck you don't draw at the beginning of your turn. You can't search the deck for anything. So you are stuck with those 10 cards. So it's a great kind of comeback objective when you're down. And you just hope that you get lucky with what you're dr you draw and your opponent gets unlucky. You know, we've played games and play testing where someone will be super far ahead in food and then they draw their 10 cards and it's nothing but, you know, dinky little foragers. And your opponent draws one big animal and it just steamrolls you. So you definitely want to make sure that uh, you, you know what you're getting yourself into with these limited resources. And last but not least, we have the pond which holds the record for the most text on a single card in Kingdom Animalia, so I will try to break it down for you. It is an aquatic freshwater biome that reads, During any management phase, a player may place an animal on this card and claim King of the Pond. That animal cannot attack, forage, or use abilities. During the combat phase, the other player may attack that animal. If the King of the Pond is killed, the animal that killed it becomes the king. At the end of the status phase, whoever controls the king gains one point. The player with the most points after 12 rounds wins lot going on here, but it's basically king of the hill. Uh, you want to control the hill for the, as many turns as you can, which uh, with 12 rounds, as, as soon as you hit uh, you know, 6 or 7, or it depends how many rounds are left, you've won. Um, you want to make sure you're putting something with high defense or high health as the king of the hill, or something with really, really high evasion, um, because when your opponent kills your animal on the, king, on the hill, their animal immediately becomes king of the hill, and so they would get the point for that round. So you really want to make sure that you um, have something that can hold its own on the hill or have a plan for getting the hill back. Just a few rules clarifications here. Uh, you can immediately place an animal from your hand to the hill if you want to. And the first player to do that gets kind of a, a natural advantage uh, because they are able to control it without too much of a rebuttal from their opponent. You can alternatively move something to the hill. Uh, if you have animals in your back front or back row and you haven't used your one move per turn yet, there's nothing on the hill, you can move an animal to the hill. Uh, but the only other way to get on there once there's an animal on there is to kill said animal. So that will wrap up the uh, reptile and amphibian side of the uh, Mammals vs. Reptiles and Amphibians 2 player starter set. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Hope you've learned something. Hope you're excited to try out these cards and get playing. And I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Thank you.